All right. So if you want to, you could write these down, but they're on a handout that you'll receive later. This is basically the information that you want about how people started thinking about creating this illusion of three dimensions. So the first rule is a really simple one. Stuff looks far away, or when stuff is far away, it looks small. Now you experience that today, whether you were driving or riding in a vehicle, cars that were you know, three blocks away look tiny. And you know intellectually that they don't suddenly grow in size just because they get close to you. When you see your friends in the hallway, you know that at the end of the hallway by the front door, they look smaller than they do when they're standing close to you. And your brain understands it. We don't like freak out and go, oh my God, a Smurf just like grew into a giant. We don't lose our minds over it. But it's something you do have to remember because a lot of times people will draw stuff that's far away way too big. So rule one, things far away look smaller than the same thing close up. Number two is the Roadrunner rule. Do you guys know that cartoon? You've heard of those, I assume. <laughs> Remember how the Roadrunner constantly tricks the coyote by like painting what looks like a tunnel on a wall? He goes running into it. The illusion that makes that tunnel is that the two sides of the road are getting closer and closer together, right? As it goes further away. That's what rule two is. Parallel lines appear to meet or converge at a point on the horizon that we call the vanishing point. Think of it like the rails on a railroad. If you've ever stood on railroad tracks on a really flat piece of ground, it looks like the two metal rails on the side get closer and closer together as it goes further and further away from you. Those two rules is really the basic need to understand points of view for this whole process. So remember also your horizon line, as we were saying earlier, is your eye level, and that matters. Stuff will look different to you if you are standing upright at your full height, or if you're seated in a chair, or if you're lying on the ground, the horizon will seem to move. So remember, we often think of the horizon as what? The horizon is where the what meets the what? Right, the sky meets the water or the ground, right? But that is false, right? We see that line in different positions based on where our head height is. So keep in mind that the horizon, in a way, is an illusion. All right. This gives you a good example of why and how people figured this out. Can you tell that this early Renaissance painter is trying to show you that those buildings have depth? What did he do that kind of sort of makes it work? Sort of. Things are small when they're in the background. That's a good point. What else? Those white lines have been added, and I extended them with red lines. What are those showing you? They tend to be on the sides of the buildings, don't they? It shows you an angle along the top of a roof line or along the top of a window or bottom of a window. And those lines go off vaguely off to the left, don't they? But do you notice that they don't actually meet in the same place? They're meeting at different heights and at different distances. And that's what makes the buildings look kind of funky. So your brain is like, I get it. It almost looks real. And then the other side of your brain is like, uh-uh, the solution's not cutting it for me. This is not working. Here's how they solved it. And it's kind of crazy. This is a very modern version of this idea. Renaissance artists built screens, literally like a window frame, with wires or strings. And those wires made perfect squares. And then they had pieces of paper with the same proportion squares on it. They would set up the frame, look at the thing they were trying to draw from a particular point of view, and they would draw exactly what they saw in each square, which resulted in them realizing that those angles on the sides of the building, if you extended them, would all meet at the same points. So it was literally through trial and error observation that we figured this stuff out. Check out how we can even use this on still life or on the human body. It's kind of a crazy image, but the one at the top is an artist trying to draw a reclining person, someone lying down. And notice he's like at the foot of the bed. He's by her feet and her 
head is way far away from him. So what he's doing, do you see right in front of him a thing that looks kind of like a sword or a dagger? He's using that to rest his forehead against, so he stays in one position. He's drawing all the curves and details of her body according to the framing device that he's looking through. And you can see the paper he's working on has his grid on it. Doing the same thing at the bottom, just a little more sophisticated version. In this case, the assistant or the apprentice is pulling the drawing outward. It's on a hinge. The artist can cite what he wants, swing the door closed. He draws in what he wants. They can open it back and forth. So it is really based entirely on this illusion of how we create three dimensions on a flat surface. And it was achieved through this level of direct observation. So we'll start simple. The easiest of the perspective systems is called one point perspective because it looks like everything's going to one point. That point is where the parallel lines seem to meet. And that point is called our vanishing point. I will mess it up, you will mess it up. Try not to say focal point. We've been saying focal point about where your attention goes in a still life or in a landscape, right? Here we mean something very different. The vanishing point is literally where those lines all seem to meet. They meet on the horizon. The vanishing point can't be floating up in the air or below that line. It has to be on that space. So if you look at those rectangular things, if we pretend they're buildings, even the one that's floating in the air, the building that is at the bottom that's closest to us or feels close, how come we only see the front and the top of that building at the bottom? This one. How come we can only see the front and the top? You are looking down on it from above, which is exactly what we did with the still life, right? You could see down onto the table. So we're looking down on it. How come I can't see the sides? Where is that building relative to me? directly in front. And if you look at where the vanishing point is, think of that as your head height as far in the distance as you can see. That is directly in front of you. The one to the right, how come I can't see the top here? Well, that's my eye level. The top is above my eyes, right? But now I can see the front and what else? The side. And that's because it's over to our visually over to the right. And obviously the one on the left, we can see up underneath it because it's floating somehow. We see the front and we see that left-hand side. However, look at the fronts of those three things. Other than their shape and size, what's something that those three fronts have in common physically? Where are they in space relative to one another? Something about them they have in common. It's a geometry class word. Starts with a P. The planes are something. The front planes of the building are something that starts with a P. Rhymes with parallel, <laughs> right? They are parallel, and they're not only parallel to each other; they're parallel to us. So if you imagine your eyes as my glasses are kind of flat across the front, try to imagine that plane, your face, being smack parallel to the front of the thing you're looking at. That defines the one point scenario. Here's our one point vanishing point. Okay, so how would we draw it? This is making it up, okay? I'm not trying to draw something that I'm observing in the real world. I'm just showing you the mechanics of how it works. First thing I need is my horizon, my eye level. In this case, I have chosen a vanishing point, but it would make sense to put it in the middle. It's directly in front of me, okay? So this thing I'm trying to draw, if we pretend it's a building, the top of it obviously is above my eye level, so logically I'm not going to see the top of the roof. And it's sitting on the ground below my eye level, I can't see up underneath it. But it's way over to my right, so what else should I see? The side wall. So I only really have to add one wall here. We're going to do that by adding leaves. Different people use different terms for these. Some people call them guidelines. Some people call them perspective lines. They actually can sometimes even be referred to as leading lines because they kind of lead your eye in a particular way. They have an actual name, like a dictionary name, and this will show up on the final exam as an extra credit. Orthogonal is the word for those lines. The orthogonals seem to meet at the vanishing point. 
If I were to draw it just like this, though, doesn't it kind of seem like those lines just go on and on and on and on forever, like my building is some crazy super, super long thing? So clearly, at some point, I need to cut it off. So let me clear this up a little bit. If I add in a vertical perfectly parallel to the front of the building, doesn't that create the illusion that I now have a side there? I mean, obviously, I could erase out the horizon line and you know, add some detail. But check this out. Let me physically get out there in the room. It's kind of a weird thing. On the screen, live, that is 28 inches tall. But if I measure the height of this part, it's only 11 inches. So is the building shrinking? Is the building cost sloping downward? You know logically that the back of the building is as tall as the front. Why does it look like that? It's far away. That's really all there is to it. So it's a weird thing. When you start looking for it and start analyzing it, sometimes it will feel a little strange to you, logically. <laughs> Visually, it should make sense. How about this one? When we're doing one-point perspective, you always start with the plane that you're parallel to, the front that I'm facing. In this case, we know from analyzing the other drawing, I should see a couple different things here. Definitely, I should see the side of the building, but what else? The top. So in order to draw that, I'm going to add in three orthogonals from the top left, top right, and bottom right. And notice that those lines are not parallel to each other in the drawing. They meet at the vanishing point. Now, this one really looks weird. Doesn't it almost look like a train? Like long, 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 long boxcar train. <laughs> so obviously the building probably isn't that long. So when I go to show you where the building ends, I'm going to put in two lines. One that's perfectly horizontal that shows where the top plane ends, and one that's perfectly vertical that shows you where the side ends. So that's probably a little different from those cubes that you learned how to draw in middle school. Did you guys ever do that? Draw a square and then kind of offset a square next to it and just make all of the corners parallel? It sort of works, right? But notice here, my lines are not parallel. They're on angles. They do meet at my vanishing point. Okay, well, that's all great. That's basic. What if I want to put in details? Windows, doors, bricks, siding, etc. It's kind of easy with the one-point buildings. Again, I'll start on the front. Even if the detail you're drawing doesn't touch the edge of the building, you can still figure out how to draw the things that are equivalent to it on the side. So you notice on my building on the right, I have a red shape that's supposed to be a door. If I just extend a line from the height of that door to the edge of the front of that plane of the front of the building, and then connect those lines, oops, wrong way, there we go. If I connect those lines to the vanishing point, notice that the details, the height of the door, the height of the windows, makes almost like the spokes on a bicycle wheel or a fan. Most people will screw up on this part more than anything else. Most people will go in and make lines that are totally parallel by the top or the bottom. So again, if I physically put the ruler in there, that sort of looks almost parallel to the top, doesn't it? And even here, that kind of works. But look how messed up it would be if I kept doing that. Right? Like the door would go down into the ground. So remember that your side details have to conform to your vanishing point. So let's look at a different scenario. These things, if we think of them as buildings, even though one is floating, are we facing head on to these? What would you say you're looking at? What's closer to you in any of those buildings? Yeah, it's really simple. Imagine that we're looking at the same thing we just saw in the diagram, but we have just kind of turned our attention to the side. It's much more common in 
fact, to see things in two-point perspective, because most of us don't walk around staying parallel to things. I'm staying parallel to the back wall. That's insane, right? Most of us don't move that way. You have driven or ridden in vehicles in this town. There ain't a 90 degree corner in this entire downtown, right? Buildings are all not all built on square plots or uh, plots of land. They're sometimes turned on an angle to make a little diamond shape in the front, right? So buildings are more often going to be seen in this direction. You are looking at the corner. So when you're drawing a building in two point perspective, it appears that each wall, left and right, are going off toward two different vanishing points. Now, in this example, imagine that this line right here that is the border of my image is also the edge of my paper. What the what? How can that be? Because now my vanishing point is where? Relative to the paper, where are my vanishing points? They're off the page. They're still there, but they're physically not inside the paper. Can that happen? Of course it can. Your horizon, think of it as an infinite line. The vanishing points have to be on that horizon somewhere. But they might not necessarily be in the image itself. And that will change when you look at the angles of those things. Just for instance, ignoring the fact that it's floating, Look at the building on the far right. If we imagine the top of it, even though we know that building has a flat top in reality, that angle versus this one. Imagine that you are standing on top of a mountain right there. You've never been on a pair of skis in your life. You're scared to death of it. Which way do you go, left or right? You've never been on skis ever, and you have to do this, which looks less scary. Why? Why is that less scary? It's not, steep. it's not as steep of an angle. So, if I look here, where the corner of my building is, the side that scared us, where the angle is steep, is the side that's closer to the vanishing point, isn't it? The side that felt a little less scary is really far away from that vanishing point. So you can kind of tell by eyeing it where the vanishing points would be, even roughly, based on the angles that you are seeing. But how does it work? In this case, again, I'm making something out of my head, I'm not drawing something that I'm observing, but I start with the horizon and two vanishing points, and the first thing I'm gonna draw is the corner, the height of the building at its corner. Then I need two orthogonals to the right and two to the left. And I end up with something that kind of looks like a big old diamond. So now I've established the plane of those two walls going to two different vanishing points, left and right. So what do you suppose I need to add to show how the building is kind of finished? What do I need next? I need to show where the wall's in, right? I need to kind of finish it. So verticals. Huh? So in a way, when you see it as like an animated diagram, it isn't that hard of a concept, but it takes a little bit of practice to get good at it. So check this out, same thing. In this case, we see, again, my horizon is my eye level. The top of the building is above my eye level, the bottom is below. Now, obviously, I'm gonna have a much more severe angle on which side, left or right, from the top. To the right, it's going to be another one of those really steep angles there because it's really close to the vanishing point. Four lines, and then I'm going to go in and show you where the building is. Yeah. Now I'm going to throw in a building that's to the left of the one that we're seeing there, is still in between the same two vanishing points. It is still parallel to that building, but not to us. We're still looking at its corner. It is now going to be entirely below our eye level. So we're going to see two walls and what else? The roof. We're going to look down on the top of it. So check this. It's kind of cool. Here's the height of the building. Two orthogonals to the right and two to the left. So it kind of makes a V shape. Now, just as we did before, I'm going to show where the walls end. 
with me? Now, how the heck do I do the roof? Most people, when they do this the first time, will go for the easiest thing to do, which is to draw one line between those two points. Why is that not going to work? It would make the building into some weird triangle instead of into a rectangular solid. So this is where we do a little bit of crisscross. From the left top back corner, I'm going to draw a line to the right vanishing point. And from the right back top corner, I'm going to draw a line to the left vanishing point. And where those two intersect gives me my missing fourth corner. If I darken those up, you can see it much clearly, much more clearly. How cool is that? So now those two buildings are parallel to one another, not to us, but to each other. And obviously it's a little basic at this level, but we probably would want doors, windows, bricks, some kind of information on there. In fact, to me, it's actually easier to do that on these buildings. Check it out. All I have to do show the height on the corner of whatever the detail is that I'm adding, whether it's bricks or windows or tops of doors. And then I connect those marks to my vanishing points on either side. And notice that as those marks get closer to the horizon, they become more horizontal. And as they dip below it, they start to angle back the other way. They're not parallel to either the top or the bottom of that building. Same thing happens on the left wall. And even on our short guy here, I've divided him into three floors. So we're just kind of seeing the borders in between the top and bottom of a flight of floor of one building. It's actually fairly easy to do. So that is the basic setup for one point and two point. So let's try to think about buildings have a little more character than this. In this situation, based on the information you're seeing there, even if I hadn't put the dot in, am I in one point or two point here? Why is it one point? You're seeing the face. You're facing a plane. You're seeing either the front or side of a building head on. So how many orthogonals do I need here to start this guy? Two, top left, bottom left, back to the vanishing point, easy peasy, a vertical to show where it ends. We're now going to make additions, things that stick off of the building. So I'm going to do a couple of them. I'm going to start always with the front face, but above the horizon, on the right-hand side, I'm going to make it look like there's a piece hanging off. It could be an architectural detail. It could be a... That's the word I'm trying to say. Yes, it could be a balcony. It could be a porch. It could be a air conditioner unit, like window unit, right? Something sticking off. In this case, because it's on that right-hand wall and it's way above us, we obviously can't see the other side of it and we can't see the top. What should I see? Just the underneath. So that one's real easy. How many lines would I need to do that? Just one from the outside bottom corner back to the vanishing point. Just a little tiny angle would show that. The harder one is the one that I've added in here at the bottom of the building on the left. On that one, we are going to see the top of that balcony. We're also going to see the outer edge of it. So check this out. The computer will add in our orthogonals. One, two, three. And now if I want to make it look like that balcony on the left is the whole length of the building, runs that whole side, then all I have to do is follow the back edge of the building down to where it intersects this line right here. So my rule for these is to do to the back exactly what you did to the front. The building comes down to this point and moves outward to the left. So using this orthogonal, I'm the analogous point right there. The building's going to come down to here and straight out. And when it hits this line, it's going to come straight down. Boom, bang. Suddenly, that looks kind of believably three-dimensional. Now, obviously, I could go in and erase some of the overlap lines. I could erase out the orthogonals that are kind of extra. But do you see how you could start to make things that look like the buildings you see in reality? Yeah? Fairly easily. 
Okay, well, here's another set. Subtractive. If I make this building, again, top, above, bottom, below, I'm only going to need two orthogonals to show where the wall ends. Now I want to show indentations to kind of reverse balcony, like a porch, right, where there's a ceiling or a roof above it. So these are indentations into the building. We're going to start by marking them on the front. And then we're going to start working on showing how they operate on the rules of perspective. The one that's at the bottom left-hand side, because it's on the other side of the building from us, we won't see any of the walls, but what should I be able to see there? If you think of it as a porch that people can stand on, I need to see the ground, the floor, right, where their feet would be. So there's only one line there. The one on the right-hand side obviously is above my eye level. I won't be able to see down onto the floor, but I should be able to see the protective ceiling over their heads, right? And the wall behind. So on that one, I'm going to need three lines. One, two, three. And again, I do the same thing to the back that I did to the front. So if the building comes down from the roof to this point and makes a 90 degree turn into the left, then that is my action point. Follow that line back to the back. Here we go. I come down from the ceiling or roof to there in and then straight down. Now, doesn't that kind of look like a capital block letter S? Could I have started with that funky shape instead of making the rectangle first and then cutting in? Yes. In a one point building, if you start with the facing plane, you can absolutely start from that beginning point. The harder ones are the two point buildings. So in this one, I'm just going to do one building that we're going to make additions to. So show my height, which is going to have the more severe angle to the left or to the right? To the left. So first I have kind of a kite shape until I put in the lines to show where my walls end. Yeah. This is the most challenging one. I'm going to add in an extension along the right hand wall. It's entirely above the horizon. And with a two-point building, I always start with the corner. So what I'm actually doing is moving the corner further to the right. I'm going to establish the height of this porch extension, kind of hovering out in space. I will connect it back to the original corner by connecting it to the left-hand vanishing point. Now can you kind of see what's happening? The building is coming down from the roof to this point where that balcony juts out in space. That's the height of it. And it comes back to the original corner and down. So to draw this part, I obviously am not going to be able to see down on top of the roof of that balcony, but I should see the wall of it, and I should be able to see up underneath it. So to establish that, I need three more lines. One, two, three. Here's the trickiest part. How do you finish it off? You do to the back what you did to the front. So the distance or the angle from the original corner to the new extension of the balcony was determined by its relationship to the left vanishing point. So instead of coming in here and just drawing a horizontal straight across and up, I need to be imitating this angle. So I'm going to line up my left vanishing point with that point right there, and extend that line outward and then up, like so. So that's how you create things like overhangs. This building, for instance, does have a flat roof. It would be a good one to use for the project. But you know, over by the entrance to the theater, it has that funky, weird architectural detail that is useless. It's just a big rectangle that with a hole in it. <laughs> it's not stopping the rain. It's not stopping the sun. It just looks cool. That's basically how you would handle adding that to that building. So things that extend off the surface, you can do this way. Let me jump you ahead to subtraction here. Same building, same basic setup. This time I'm going to make an indentation on the right-hand side 
above the horizon. So another one of our covered porches, like there's a section that kind of dents in on that side of the building. So I'm gonna move the height of this section from the original corner to the left. I'm gonna show the top of it and the bottom edge of it by connecting it on that left-hand vanishing point. So again, since this is above my eye level, I should be able to see up into the ceiling of that space. I shouldn't be able to see the floor because it's above eye level, but I should see the back wall. So I'm gonna need three more orthogonals. One, two, three. And then I do to the back what I did to the front. If I come down from the top of the building again, Here's the angle of the indentation that I made, and that angle is determined by this left vanishing point. So if I think of that as my action point, follow along that line until I get to the equivalent place on the back side, the building now needs to come down to here and then in on an angle to the left. That angle will be determined by connecting where the mouse is right now to that green dot on the left. Boom. When those intersect straight down, we'll finish that section off. So even things that look really, really complicated to you can be simplified pretty easily with this system. Ready to practice? I'm going to do some live now instead of with the animation. And I'll switch this over so you can see what I'm drawing. I want you guys to draw along with me. I think if I use a sharpie, we can have the lights up and you can still see. So we're going to do five drawings. You could do two each on the front side and flip one over for the fifth. Should be OK. If you want more paper, there's plenty more newsprint. If you want to use your own, that's fine, too. You should have rulers that actually have numbers on them that you can read. Um, you don't have to do any real measuring right now. The first step for this first one, I'm going to draw it pretty big. You could do yours like this. You could take just the top half of one side to make it a little easier to draw. All right, first, first, I'm going to put in my horizon line. I'm going to go ahead and do mine with marker, make it easier for you all to see. So again, that's my eye level. And for the sake of argument, let's put our vanishing point right in the middle. Easy peasy. some new pencil sharp markers. All right. So I'm going to start by doing, this is a one point situation. So remember, we are parallel to the thing we are looking at. I'm going to start by drawing in to the right a building where the top is above, the bottom is below my horizon line. doing a 
reasonably careful job of trying to keep this as straight up and down as possible. So if this is the front of my building, the top of it where the pencil is right now is above my eye level, so I shouldn't be able to see down onto the roof. The bottom is below my eye level, so I can't see up underneath it. It's not slap dap in front of me. It's over to my right, so I should see just one thing, right? One more wall. To establish that, I'm connecting the top left corner to the vanishing point with an orthogonal line. In the bottom left corner. So I think you can still sort of see my pencil lines there. Remember, those are my guidelines, my leading lines, my perspective lines. They will show up on the test, the final exam at the end of the semester. They have a dictionary name. I'm writing it down here. You can add that onto your drawing as well. Or fog or null. I sometimes try to say it with a little bit of an exaggerated southern accent. If I call it a orthogonal, then it kind of rhymes with diagonal, because they mostly are, and that should make it a little easier to remember. But remember, that extra credit is coming towards you at the end of the term. That's the actual name of what we're doing. So since I've established this wall, we've got the plane drawn in. If I leave it the way it is, it looks like my building's going on and on forever. So I need to add what? To finish off that wall, what do I need to add? I'm going to show a vertical to kind of cut it off, right? So if I do that, again, I'm making it up so it can be where I want it. I'm going to darken that up for you with the marker. Pretty easy. So next challenge, so to speak, is to add in a building to the left of the vanishing point. This one I want to draw in entirely below my horizon. So since I'm in one point perspective, what do I add first? To start this building off, I have to draw what first? Yeah, basically the front face, the top to bottom height of that front plane. It be a square or a rectangle. Just make sure that you are pretty far over to the left so you have some good room to work there. And as that is the front, I can also go in and darken it right away with my sharpie. Okay. So if I label these points A, B, C, and D, which one of those do I need to connect to my vanishing point to draw my building? This top left one is A, bottom left is B, top right is C, bottom right is D. Which ones connect to the vanishing point? A, B, C, D. A and C are going to establish the top. And then D. How come I'm not doing B? I'm 
unless the building was made entirely of glass, right, so it's totally see-through, we wouldn't be able to see the line there. So A, C, and D are going to get connected back to my one point vanishing point. So now it looks like I've got this weird train that's kind of going on forever and ever and ever. To finish it off, do to the back what you did to the front. The front is cut off by a horizontal between A and C and a vertical between C and D. So I'm going to pick a point over here and decide that's where the building is going to end. Draw a straight across line between the first two orthogonals and then a straight vertical downward line between the middle orthogonal and the bottom. So. Darken up the edges so you can see it a little better. Y'all with me so far? easy, right? So now it's time to deal with Doors, windows, details. Yep. Yes, we'll get there. We absolutely will. Um, most of the time, when you are driving or riding in a vehicle, downtown Wilmington especially, you will see buildings sometimes that are parallel to you straight ahead. You'll see buildings that are turned a little bit on an angle to your side. That would be a situation where you'd have a two-point and a one-point simultaneously. You could have multiple sets of vanishing points for multiple different objects. And in point of fact, probably when we did our still life, everything was turned at a slightly different angle probably really would have had if you'd measured it out and looked for vanishing points, different sets for each object. That absolutely can happen. The one rule that has to stay in place, always, is that the vanishing points themselves have to be on the horizon. I'm going to show you really quickly what happens if we do doors and windows wrong. I know I just made the drawing a little harder to see. I'm using a piece of tracing paper here, and I'm just darkening up the image below. I want to take my time a little bit on this because it's pretty critical to the success of your next project. Most people can get the outside shapes pretty accurate. Most of us will be okay with that stuff. It's when we start adding in the details that make the image look more real, the doors, the windows, the lines in between the layers of brick, that things start to get weird. 
So first, I'm going to do these wrong. Okay, so you've got two buildings in two uh, in one point perspective. I'm parallel to these front planes. It would be relatively easy, probably, for you to draw in doors, rows of windows if the windows aren't connected, or maybe banks of windows where they are completely glass all the way across and you just kind of see the top and bottom edge of them like here or even maybe a window that's just sort of sitting in the middle of the wall not touching the edge i mean there's all kinds of things that you might see right most people when they go in to deal with these will not really figure out how to do this here's the wrong way oh i'll make a window there doesn't that look weird what is off with that it doesn't follow the angle of the building at all, right? It looks really kind of weird. What happens if I do this? Well, these windows are just straight across. Oh my God, that's even worse. How about here? Okay, let's get fancy. Okay, well, I'm gonna try to figure out where the height of those windows is here and here. And they should follow the angle maybe of the top of the building because it's going away from me. What happens if I put in a line that's parallel to the top. And suddenly my windows look like they're going down into the ground, don't they? It's insane. It just doesn't look right. More often than not, it happens with things like this. Let's say you've got a building here um, that's divided into lots of little tiny brick lines. If you start making all the brick lines parallel to the roof line, it seems okay until about here. You see how it's starting to not fit in? Eventually, uh-oh, what the, the that doesn't work, right? So to make these things work properly, always start on the front facing plane when you're working with your one point buildings. I'm gonna put a window that's kind of isolated itself. I'm going to put in a couple where they are panes of glass that go all the way across the whole surface. So you just see the divisions between the floors. I'm going to put in a row where the windows do not touch one another. They're separated by a little bit of space. I'm going to put in the height of a door. So to deal with these on this side, if I'm trying to make the equivalent image types of windows and doors that I see over here, the easy ones are the ones that touch the edge, right? That's not so hard. As long as I'm not making them totally parallel to the top, but actually lining them up with my vanishing point, I'm pivoting as I go. That should be pretty easy. Okay, no problem. But how do I deal with these things that don't touch the edge? It's easier than you think. If you take the ruler and mark the height of the door, yeah, I take the ruler and mark the height of these windows, So that's a window height, that's a window height, that's the door height. So as I remember to connect them to the vanishing point, remember that as the lines get closer to the horizon, they're gonna get more horizontal. As they go above it, they'll be more extremed, extreme in terms of their angle. Now here I can kind of eyeball this. That window is set in from the edge. So as long as I put in perfectly vertical lines, I can kind of guesstimate what that window should look like. 
these guys, as long as their left and right edges are straight up and down, as long as I make them get smaller as they go back, looks pretty convincing. Maybe I have two doors on this wall since it's kind of long. Fairly straightforward, yeah? So go ahead and add some doors and windows onto your buildings. They could be very simple. For this one, I'm just going to simply divide it with lines that show the separation between the floors. I'm going to make this a three-story building, which means I'm only adding in two lines. And connecting those. my vanishing point. So as you're working on these, just kind of adding in some details, I really want to emphasize why we do this, why we're learning this, why it's going to be important as you go forward. When you think about the types of careers that art students want, the things that people want to do artistically or want to do in terms of making a decent living, if you are adept at perspective drawing, you could get a job in drafting, you could get a job working for an architecture firm, you could become an architect yourself. If you are interested in interior design and decoration, these skills are critical to being able to convince a client to spend money on your idea. But more importantly, maybe than any of those, 
the types of drawings that students share with me most frequently, the first week of school, first semester, every year, most people who start drawing nowadays tend to copy things that they really love from their favorite sources. A lot of students draw manga, anime, comic book characters, those kind of things. Even my generation, as ancient as I am, drew Spider-Man and the Hulk and all of that stuff. But the thing that makes those images work, the thing that makes them compelling, is that they look believable in some respects. And it's very often those backgrounds, the settings that the characters are having their epic battles in. If there's a perspective error in those drawings, it takes you out of the fantasy. It makes it feel less real, less invested in reality. So we want you to have these skills not because I'm going to insist that you take a ruler and draw everything you draw for the rest of your life with a ruler. I want you to understand what you're seeing and why it looks the way it does. So that you could make a quick sketch. You could do a gestural sketch of a building by eyeballing the angles of the roof and the floor. You would kind of know more or less if you were right based on this basic knowledge of one and two point perspective. You can increase that and get tighter and more specific and more detailed, or you can keep it a little bit loose, but I just want you to really think about what you're doing, what your goal is, is learning to create a believable illusion of three dimensions on a two dimensional surface. Most Art students, when they begin their careers, are interested in the careers that will earn money, the architecture, illustrator type degrees. Fine, great. But also people are interested in making their drawings look quote unquote realistic. A lot of people this year already have said to me, I want to make my drawings look more realistic. Here's your big key. So the first half of the semester, we concentrated on measuring and proportion and volume, and light and shadow. Now we're going to do a series of projects where we focus on using those tools as we explore this idea of three-dimensional space. And the more that we do that, the stronger your drawings are going to get. If your goal is to get out of art school and draw convincing battles between imaginary characters that you've made up in your awesome manga world that you're working on at home and that you hope to get published someday, if the world around those characters that you can draw and make it look more believable, you're more likely to have success. So as always, remember, this is level one, right? We're gaining beginning skills, not so much just to make this picture. You're not going to put this thing you did today in a frame. But how much is it going to help you when it's your turn to do a drawing and you decide you want to draw a building or a room as either a background or a setting for something else? So remember that it's not just about meeting the goal of one assignment. Your goal is really about your overall achievement. I want to think of these things as like arrows that you're putting into your quiver on your back. Right? The more arrows you have, the more tools, the better, more capable you're going to be to meet your goals. I want to do one more drawing with you before we take a break. We'll come back and finish the other three. But just to move us on a little bit, let's try the basic two point. So again, remember, I am making this one up. I'm not drawing something that is being observed. So I'm starting with a horizon line. I am deciding where my two vanishing points are going to be. With the two-point buildings, am I facing the front of the things anymore? I'm facing the what? McKinley, I'm facing the, yeah, the side, the corner, right? So on the right here, in between my two vanishing points, because they're going to share these two, these two buildings will be parallel to each other, but not to me, I'm going to put in the height of this building so that the height of it is tall, 
The top of it is above my horizon line, the bottom is below. So I'm going to need two orthogonals from the top and bottom of the height of my corner going to the left. And I imagine it's going to be hard for you to see this. I just broke my darker pencil lead. And again, because I am closer to the vanishing point on my right-hand side, my angles are much more severe on what I'm describing now as the right-hand wall. From here, all I need to do next is show where the walls end. So I'm adding in vertical or as close to perfectly vertical as I can get. Ending walls, which I will darken for you so you can see it better. So from that original corner, two orthogonals from the top and the bottom to the left, two orthogonals from top and bottom to the right. And then I just added in these two verticals to show where the walls end. On this one, I do want my next building to be parallel to this guy, not to me. So if two buildings are in two-point perspective and they are parallel to one another, they will share the same two vanishing points. So I'm going to just make this one entirely below my horizon line, a little bit to the left of my original shape. So when I add in my orthogonals to the left and to the right, I'm going to be creating sort of a big V shape. Slipped a little there. Once that V is in place, I'm going to add in the verticals to show where my walls end. And here's the critical part. From the top left, that corner, I want to go for the right. From the right, that corner, I want to go to the left. So where those two lines I'm adding in meet is where that extra missing fourth corner is. So from the left, I'm aligning it with the right vanishing point and carrying that line across.
on the right. I'm lining up with my left vanishing point and meeting that across. So there is my fourth corner. Another thing that pops to mind as we're working in this way is a lot of times art students will say to me that they didn't have a good time in high school or middle school because certain subjects were harder for them. And a lot of times the subject that art students struggle with the most is math. Not saying that that's true for absolutely everyone. My mom is a really great artist, but she's also really good at math. My dad needed to take algebra one three times to pass it. <laughs> so he's also a very successful artist. It's not, you know, everyone has their own strengths and weaknesses. But the thing that jumps out at me about this is that what we're doing right now, really, y'all, is math, it's geometry. We're not necessarily doing something critical with numbers at the moment, but we are absolutely using spatial skills that are mathematic in their origin. So don't accept it when you tell yourself, when you feel yourself saying, I'm not good at math, mm -mm, not true. Your skills may be more visually based, doesn't mean you can't do this. One thing about the two-point buildings that I think is easier than the one-point is when it comes to doing the details on the walls. So again, I want to show you what happens if you do those wrong. Okay, so you should have something kind of like this for your two-point drawing. So the first thing that I do when I'm working this way is to mark the height of the items, whether that is the whole floor, like ceiling to floor, an entire floor unit, whether it's the height of windows, whatever. In this case, I made a lot of them on this building on the right. Here's doing it wrong. Sometimes people will start off and it looks okay if I keep my ruler perfectly parallel to that roof line. This first one looks all right. The next couple probably look okay. Look how weird it looks the further I go.
especially from here forward, it's now really clear that something is wrong with my drawing. Don't you think? Uh-oh. even worse if I go the other way. What if I make them parallel to the bottom edge? What I'm doing right here is how a lot of times beginning artists will draw bricks, siding, they'll pick one, whether it's the top edge and keep it parallel or the bottom edge and keep it parallel, and that just doesn't look right. In fact, it looks really kind of messed up. Keep it parallel to the bottom edge here. And to the top edge here, it just looks redonkulous. Just doesn't quite fit. So this is the don't do it this way part. <laughs> to do it right, mark off the heights of your floors on the corner edge of your building. And then line those up with your vanishing point on each side.
That's a perfect stopping point. Great. Make sure everybody has the basics of one and two point down. Go ahead and look at some sunlight, get some fresh air, water, walk around a little bit, move your limbs. Be back in about 10 minutes and I'll take you through some slightly more complex setups, including the what happens if you have a one point and two point happening at the same time. <laughs> 